Hey everybody, my name is Danielle. I am the volunteer coordinator and outreach coordinator for Northwest Veg. Um, I know if you have watched any of our stuff before, this is going to be, this introduction is going to be old news to you. But in case we've got folks who haven't joined us before or looking for a refresher, um, I've been a vegan since 2007. Uh, I ran my own vegan uh, and gluten-free bakery and kitchen for several years, and I've done some catering for sports officials throughout Canada and the United States. And cooking is a really big passion of mine. Anybody who has spent time with me um, while I'm in the kitchen knows that soups are a really big passion of mine. And one of the things that I love about soup is that Unlike some other areas of cooking, um, I think it's very easy to make soups that please everybody. There are a lot of soups that are naturally vegetarian or naturally vegan. Um, you can make some really complex flavors and it, there are plenty of soups that somebody isn't expecting meat to be in. And if they were expecting meat, we have some um, different ways that we can create, put, diff put different proteins in there. Um, but really, what makes your soup so often is our broth and our base. So that was one of the reasons why um, we wanted to do something that was focusing on soup bases. And so today I'm gonna be going over a couple of different experimental approaches that we can take um, for making more complex soups. This is kind of a soup 101 foundation. So first thing before I do anything else, I'm gonna go ahead and take out some veggies that I've had roasting. Yes. Okay. So the first thing I want to cover is our vocabulary, because if we don't all agree on what we're talking about, it's going to be challenging for us to be able to build off of that. So the problem is that even in um, the culinary world, even if you are going to a culinary school or you're talking to seasoned chefs who work in the industry or who cook a lot at home, there can be some disagreements when we talk about a soup base, um, when we talk about a soup stock or a soup broth. I'm going to give you some rules of thumb, but just recognize that when you're sifting through recipes, when you're looking at stuff online, when you're reading stuff in magazines, just because we have come to this understanding of what we're gonna be defining stuff as today, that doesn't mean that the writer of that blog or who's creating that recipe has come to that same understanding um, because it, it's still up for debate. Um, but typically speaking, um, as a rule of thumb, let's see what I did with my examples here, um, a soup base is going to usually be something that is very, very, very thick. It's gonna be, um, almost like a, a briny paste. So for folks who have ever used like Vegemite, um, I'm trying to think of anything else that would be this like salty, flavorful paste, but I'll show you an example. This is better than bouillon. Um, and it's actually pretty loose because I got the garlic kind, but I'll show you the texture here. And you can see it almost has like a jam-like spread right? Like a big old blob of it is hanging onto my knife. So what we have here is it is so incredibly concentrate, both in the flavors and in the salt content, that it is a little bit of this goes a long way. So this is something that you would just be using, tossing in. Um, in fact, they recommend one teaspoon um, for, would create one eight ounce can of soup. So very, very little goes a long way. And just in case people wanna see the brand here, let's see, mm. yeah, it's better than bouillon. So they have a vegetable based one. They also have, uh, this one is roasted garlic, which I'm really excited about. I hadn't seen that before. So with this, you're gonna find it overwhelmingly salty. And again, it's gonna have that spreadable feature to it. Now stock, traditionally speaking, if you were to talk to someone at a culinary school, stock is something that is almost always involving animal parts. Um, in fact, a lot of culinary experts would argue that you can't have um, stock without bones. 
And the reason why that is, is because you, you're taking all the same ingredients that you would for making a broth. You're taking your carrots and your onions and all of these other things, but you are slowly simmering it with the bones and the collagen and a lot of the parts of the bones are coming out that fat. And then that creates a heartier, almost a jello-like consistency. Um, so in that instance, then uh, nothing that I am going to put that is not an additive um, with my vegetables and my mushrooms and my, my um, herbs is going to give it that rich um, jello-like consistency. So, I mean, I could put in a little bit of agar powder. I could put in a little bit of xanthan gum, a little bit of flaxseed or chia, um, but it's not just the texture. It is also the ingredients that come from that. But you can still find ingredients or recipes online for a veggie stock. Um, again, up to you on whether or not you want to just be prepared. That, that way you'll know. If somebody ever tells you there's no such thing as a veg vegetable stock, um, you'll be able to know. But so this brand, this is from the Nor. This is Home Style Stock uh, Bouillon. And it is vegetarian. And you can see I've opened it here. Let me see if I can get my a little hand light, grab a flashlight. That way you can see like, so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty jello-y, right? Like just kind of stays in its container. Um, so it is also very thick. It's got that jello jiggly. If I were to put it on a plate here, this lid, if I can get it out without breaking it up too much, we would see that it's going to keep its shape, which is what you would expect for a stock because it should have those fats in there. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see it's just stayed in its little, little shape there. So um, I believe this has palm oil in it that is, yes. So they've put palm oil and tomato paste in it um, to give it that extra shape um, and I think that they've just added a little bit of extra herbs and spices to give it more depth to the flavor. But so that's um, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about a base, when we're talking about a stock. And then a broth is any, you can make a broth out of stock, you can make a broth out of base, you can also just make a broth. So a broth for good rule of thumb is for sipping, right? Like the broth is the final product of something that is watery, it is comprised of flavors that you have steeped in it. It's basically like vegetable tea. Um, and then the stock is the concentrate version down for that. So that's what we're working with today. We're gonna to be talking about a couple of different options that we can do to make versions of a base um, or a broth. And then from there, you can build onto it to whatever you want. What I really wanna emphasize as we go through this is that there are vegetables that I would advise avoiding. Um, last week when we did the sauce series and we were talking about using wines in our sauces, we talked about avoiding um, anything that was too like a rosé or too fruity. Um, and we also talked about avoiding wines that had been aged in oak barrels because that steeps out and then it gives everything an oaky flavor. There are vegetables that can do the same thing. So it depends on what you have envisioned for your broth or your stock um, or your base. And that's gonna kind of drive what vegetables you would wanna put in it. There are of course some main players that would be found in almost all of them, um, but we'll just kind of go through and I'll give you some, some do's and don'ts depending on what you want. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is if you are somebody who cooks with raw vegetables a lot, chances are really good that you end up with scraps, right? You end up with just little bits here and there um, and everybody's scraps are gonna be different amounts. Maybe somebody would glean like a ton more off of this onion. Um, you're gonna end up with carrot tops, um, 
oops, you're going to end up with kind of little wilted bits that uh, maybe some some stuff that you meant to make something out of, but now it's getting like a little lackluster and it's it's looking a little under the weather and you don't have any specific plans for it. So you don't want it to go to waste. We know that when it comes to tracking sustainability, there are a lot of different avenues on what foods are the best, right? Because there's different concepts and criteria. There's land use, there's water use, there's the amount of labor it takes to harvest it. Um, so if something takes five years before it produces any kind of fruit, that's taken a lot of water and land and labor to produce something. Um, so what the number one thing is, if you are someone who cares about sustainability, that you can do to help minimize food waste, water waste, agriculture waste, um, is you can save as much of your food as possible and reinvent a way to utilize it so you don't go out and buy stuff again. I would say beyond that, you can also make it so that you do not have to um, buy things that are packaged, right? Like this little guy came with so much packaging. He had a little plastic or a little uh, lid on top, and then we had the packaging for everything on top of it. Um, so if we're able to be in a position where we're minimizing going out to the store and buying something new altogether, and if we are able to minimize um, having to buy something for packaging, then we're going to be in a great situation to helpful, hopefully minimize having to give that dent to our sustainability goals. The one, one great way to do that is when we have these scraps, Keep um, a Tupperware or a freezer bag. Um, you're, it, it, it doesn't need to be something that will help prevent freezer burn. So I wouldn't just put it in a paper bag and I wouldn't put it in just a traditional Ziploc. It, I would say something that's freezer safe. Um, toss your scraps in here. And then, so I've got some celery from some somebody eating snacks. Um, I've got stems of parsley from when I was making some pasta and we often um, remember last week when we made the marinara sauce, I specifically said, we don't put the, the stems in there. They're woody, they are stringy. Um, sometimes they can get bitter very quickly. So I have some stems left over. Um, I have some onion that was just like on its last leg. And I've got some odds and ends of green onions um, that needed, that were on their way out. So I threw them in the freezer. Usually I have quite a bit more, um, but I had to use it, a lot of it for my experimentations uh, for our soups and stocks. So making soup base is a lot like jazz. Um, I could give you specific recipes, but because I don't know what kind of soup you are wanting to make, um, you're gonna to wanna to change it. And the great thing is that you can taste it as you go and you can get an idea. Um, it's gonna change over time. Um, the soup that you are tasting today, if you put it in the fridge and you let it steep for a day and then take it back and begin the process again, it's gonna have a different flavor. But I am gonna show you um, some recipes and some discussions and some rules of thumb. So that way you will be able to make your own soup bases going forward. Now, the first thing that I wanted to do was to actually try to make my own bouillon base, that salty, spreadable, jam-like consistency. Um, with that, I found a couple of uh, recipes online for meat-based ones, and then I kind of modified them. Um, and I would say that this is gonna be a recipe that people are interested in if they're very whole foods focused. Um, I don't find that I get the best flavor and the best like bang for my buck with this. But um, basically what the recipes suggested was getting a food processor. And this is this guy I just used, so he's a little dirty, but get a food processor and then make sure that you have kind of the eye of the hurricane or the S blade and put it in your food processor. And then you're gonna wanna get carrots, onion, parsley, celery, um, a little bit of dried tomato. If you don't have that, you can use tomato paste and then um, a bunch of salt. So basically your ratio should be like, if you're using three carrots and three ribs of celery, then you're going to end up using, let's see, you're, you're going to end up using about a third of this. 
Um, so it is a lot of salt and that salt is preserving it. That is, it is preserving because you've just broken down all of this very perishable stuff. And so we want to make sure that it's not going to go rancid immediately. And then also it's in theory, it's going to be bringing out the flavor when you are cooking it. Um, and it can, and it does. It is what I would say a mild flavor compared to what we can do with these vegetables, but it is something that can be quick, can be easy, and it is very fresh. So I did do the food processor, and as you can see, I have such a tiny little guy. I've got, I've got a little tiny baby food processor, um, which was great because I only wanted to make a little bit of this. This is not my normal um, soup base that I start with. What I was able to get the results from my food processor, which he's not the best quality, was the, I'll see if I can show you. It came out as kind of like a pico consistency. You can see there, this is definitely not a spreadable base, right? Um, so it, it looks like a fine pico. So I wasn't super happy with that. Then I thought, you know, if the goal is to get it into a paste, um, what if I use my juicer? So I used my juicer here, uh, just as I would say, like a mid-level juicer, it's nothing heavy hitting. And when you get stuff out with your juicer, you know, you obviously fill up the juice container, but then you have kind of the vegetable leavings. And so, let's see if I can not wash this out too much. You know, you can see this is pretty finely ground. Um, but it also still is not what I would call a spreadable paste, even when I added the juice back in, because I definitely wanted to make sure I don't just have dried extracted leftovers, because this is not going to be flavorful. I pulled all the juice out. So I, I put it, the juice back in, and then I ended up taking it to the blender. And when I put it in the blender, which this feels like too many steps. And I think if I was doing this now, um, again, I would have just done the food processor um, and then maybe added in water and, and salt together because I, the reason why I didn't put this in my Vitamix just to start with is because it's all vegetables and salt. Uh, we don't want too much liquid in there because we want to keep it, you know, we want it thick, we want it spreadable. And the salt really is supposed to be just like breaking things down. So this is the end result of all of that, right? Like I put it in the food processor, had that pico de gallo. Then I took another batch, put it through my juicer, had the dried kind of version of pico de gallo plus juice. I took both of those and put them in here with the juice that was extracted. And so you can see, um, I do now have kind of like it's thick, it's been getting thicker. Um, it's very, very fragrant. It smells like onion, celery, parsley, um, and you could freeze that. And so I would add more salt to this actually, because I went a little light on the salt because I was kind of improvising between the two. I'll share the recipe. Um, I'll have Jacqueline send out an email with that. But I, you can freeze this, you can put it in ice cube trays, you can freeze it, you can add it into the beginnings of your soups and your stocks and things like that. I still found it when I did that, I found it to not be that rich in flavor. So the texture wise, I had accomplished that, um, but I didn't find it to be as bold and enhanced with the flavors of the vegetables that I was going for. Um, but if you're somebody who likes to avoid oil, if you're somebody who um, wants to do things as natural as possible, I think that this would be a great option. I think it is definitely something that you can work with. You might end up using a little bit more than you would traditionally, like you might use more than you would with this. Um, and I think especially if you were to blend in some extra herbs and things like that, that might open up stuff, um, like some rosemary or something. I wouldn't put them in the blender with that. I would maybe just have a bunch of it sitting in it and then put it in the freezer. So there's, we were able to make a base and it accomplished the goals that I had for that base. But I wanted, to make a richer and more complex stock. So there's a couple different ways that we can do that. Um, one is you take your food scraps and you 
roast them for about an hour. So you can see here, I've got my onion, some mushroom, some celery. Um, you take your food scraps and you roast them, you toss them in oil, and a little bit of salt, and you roast them for about an hour. That's gonna create kind of a caramelization um, that's also going to create, it's going to sweeten things up. It's going to enhance a lot of that carrot. The carrot has a lot of sugars in it. Um, the onion, that water is going to seep out. You're going to get the caramelizations. You're going to get a sweeter onion. Now, last week in the sauce series, we talked about the different kinds of onions to use to make a sauce. And we talked about why I wouldn't recommend making a sauce with a sweet onion because it's such high water content, low sulfur content. It's already very sweet when you're caramelizing or you're making that sauce you're not getting a lot of benefit out of it. In fact, you're, you're blanding it up. Um, so when we take a sharp onion, the kind that really makes us cry when we start cutting into it um, and we caramelize that, you're gonna get such a rich flavor. When we're making um, a broth, we can be a little bit more forgiving when we're making our broth or our stock because it's scraps, right? So if you are using, if you use sweet onion all the time, because you absolutely love it in your salads and on your sandwiches and things like that. And then you think, boy, Danielle told me not to use um, sweet onion when making sauces. So I guess it's not good for that. I mean, it's not going to matter. We're just, this is number one to make delicious foods with, but number two, it's a great way to use up those leftovers. So add it in. If it's all sweet onion, I do think you're going to have a little less punch with it because um, sweet onion, as we talked about, just doesn't bring that punch nearly as much. But um, I think that there's no reason why it can't have some of it in there. So what I am going to do is I'm gonna show you the two different other methods that we can make a soup base and talk about the differences between the two and talk about the differences between the base that we just did um, using the blender. So the first one is, I've got my roasted veggies. Um, this is if you have the time. If you're somebody who loves to do food prep and this is your Sunday activity, and or you know if you're making enough of the broth, you only need to do this once every couple of months, you know, depending on how much you use the broth. Um, so depending on how much you're going to use it, yes, this already is an hour of labor in here. If you wanna skip that stuff and just start with making the broth, um, you can absolutely do that. And so in that instance, you're just gonna go ahead and get your pot and you are gonna to wanna to use some oil. Um, you, like I would recommend using oil to uh, like kind of scald and brown everything on the outside. Um, we're basically doing a quicker version of this. Uh, I don't recommend going heavy on the oil. The reason why is um, because if you were going to use this stock um, later, and let's say you're gonna make like a potato soup or something like that, um, if it's super oily, it's not gonna freeze very well. It'll kind of break down. It, I mean, it still will freeze, but it just won't be the same quality. Um, and it's gonna kind of smother some of the, the subtleties of the vegetables that we're gonna be sauteing. So you do wanna use some oil. Um, I would recommend, as we talked about in the sauce series, um, if, you, if you insist on using an olive oil, use a very light olive oil because its smoke factor, its burn factor is, is a lot higher than others. And we're not gonna be getting the subtleties of olive oil because we're sauteing things. We're immediately neutralizing the flavor of the olive oil. So you can use a canola oil, you could use butter, um, well, some kind of plant-based butter, and or you could also use um, coconut oil. I am going to share in the chat um, a list from PETA for getting some of the um, best friendly, um, animal friendly kinds of coconut oils that don't abuse monkeys. Um, I don't know if anyone had heard, but there are some coconut product companies that utilize basically slave labor of monkeys to pick the coconuts. So uh, it's important for us to kind of take a look and see where we can get our ethically sourced coconut oil. So I'll share that in the chat um, in just a moment. But if we're gonna skip our step, and we haven't roasted our veggies and we just wanna get started on making a soup base. 
then um, we can go ahead and we're gonna toss in, like this is my onion scrap that I have left. I've got a couple more onions here. Um, we can toss in after we've heated it up and we got the oil hot. And we're not gonna saute it too much because we're not putting this on pasta. We're not trying to make this delicious to eat now. We really are just trying to get the sugars coming out. If you've ever been in a situation where you have maybe like eaten um, a dish where you thought, oh, this is gonna be so good. It has pepper and onion and parsley and, and basil and it's gonna be so good. And then you took a bite and it kind of tasted like Fruit Loops. And what I mean by that is like every bite just had the same generic combination. And instead you were like, I couldn't tell you that there was red pepper in this. I honestly couldn't taste it. It just had a vaguely pepper-esque, vaguely onion-esque um, herbed combo. Um, when we, that's kind of how I felt with this version um, because we hadn't broken down the complexities of this. And so I felt like it, this has a vegetable taste, but it's very nondescript and it isn't very in depth. So you just take whatever scraps, you can take carrot, onion, um, garlic is a good one. Here's where I'm gonna dive into the no-no vegetables, or at least uh, stop and think about what you're doing vegetables. Um, you definitely don't want anything that is too bitter, right? Like you're not gonna wanna put arugula. Um, there's a lot of greens, like mustard greens can get kind of bitter. Um, you wouldn't wanna be doing that. I did not put my herbs in here yet, just because as we talked about in the sauce series, uh, if you cook herbs on a very high heat with oil for too long, they can get bitter. So right now, I'm not, and I'm not gonna try to caramelize parsley. So that's, that's just not a thing. So right now I've just got um, my celery, my onions, my carrot, and I'm gonna toss in some mushrooms as well. So you wanna avoid something that's bitter. Um, and I would say adding to that, if your table scraps have cabbage related plants, um, or like anything from the cabbage family. Broccoli, you can get away with if you are looking for a broccoli flavored um, soup. But broccoli is one of those things where you might be making a nice vegetable soup and you want it to have like, mm, I want you to be able to taste that carrot. I want you to be able to taste the onion. I put in a little bit of tomato broth. Um, I really want this to be good. And then you put in broccoli. Now it all tastes like broccoli. And now it tastes like mostly broccoli with maybe a background hint of those other flavors. So you, if you are looking for that, like you're gonna be making cream of broccoli soup all the time, um, or maybe you like having like a creamy broccoli risotto, then absolutely use your broccoli scraps. But if you're somebody who's trying to make a multifaceted broth because you're gonna make it to use in things all month long, then I would advise um, against doing that. So while this is browning, what am I gonna do with these guys? Well, um, I am gonna go ahead and we don't have to saute these because uh, they're already in a situation where we've already done all this work. We did it over a period of an hour. So I'm gonna add water to it because we also wanna get the brown sauce that kind of got down on the bottom. Um, that's, we wanna kind of deglaze this and that's all the good stuff. That's the caramelization. That's the complexities and the richness, the mushrooms left, the onions left. So I filled my skillet with water and now I've taken, uh, you can take just any kind of non-abrasive thing, just kind of stir it around uh, and try to work off anything that's peeled to the bottom. And then just kind of stir it around and make sure that we get any of the good liquid off of that. And I will show you. How, what a difference it makes. So this is water from that skillet, right? So you can see um, it's we're, we've got a lot of flavor there. We've got a lot of browning and a lot of caramelization. We don't wanna miss out on that flavor. So I'm gonna go ahead and take it. I'm gonna put it in my pot over here and add it. 
Um, the amount of water is not super important because you're going to be reducing it down over the next hour anyways. I would just, but you can always add more. So um, I'll show you how much I added right here. You know, I would say it's about half full. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and put that on there. And I'm gonna add a bay leaf to both of these. This, I'm gonna give another quick stir and see if we've got stuff caramelizing. Looks like stuff is coming along. They're getting kind of sweaty right now. Um, and by when somebody says to like sweat your onions or um, to sweat your carrots and onions, let's see if I can get a good example here. What they mean is it's basically do this until before it caramelizes. So um, if you ever see somebody saying sweat, it's basically turning it so that it is now kind of glossy. It's almost translucent. Um, it's kind of sweaty looking, right? So if we compare this to, let me turn this around so you can see the color of purple. Here's a raw onion, you can see. And then here it is, it's been cooking long enough. So we can see like this guy's been sweating. He sweated off some of his purple. He's a little translucent. Um, so these guys are kind of in the pre-browning stage right now, which is fine. Um, and you'll also notice I didn't chop everything up into really small pieces. You absolutely can. Um, it's up to you. If you have leftovers that you just threw in a bag and you're getting them out, you can also leave them in big chunks. We're going to be steeping this for so long that it's going to make not going to make the biggest difference. So it's just your preference. Going back to the no-no list, I also you'll notice I haven't put potatoes in either of these. There's a couple reasons. One is if I was going to turn this into a soup right now, um, and let's say that I wasn't just using scraps uh, because these are ultimately going to be the solids will be removed from our base when we're done with this. Um, but if I were going to actually use this and make a vegetable soup, I still wouldn't put potatoes in this right now because we don't want the starches and the potatoes to break down and start coating everything. We don't need the potatoes to be browning. They're not going to caramelize, um, like the onions and the celery and the carrots are. The sugar in them is attached to a starch compound. So it's, it's just not going to react the same. It's actually going to kind of inhibit. It'll start sweating a lot of moisture and things won't brown. They'll just kind of like sit in a very mild bath of potato sweat um, while your potatoes are gonna get, start to get kind of gummy and starchy. So we don't brown potatoes with other vegetables, um, rule number one. But beyond that, I would not be making a stock or a base or a broth um, with potatoes. I'm not gonna make the base of a broth with these potatoes. And the reason behind that with potatoes is because again, that starchiness, it's gonna create a cloudy one. Um, and it also is just not gonna be in a position where it is going to, uh, like it can inhibit preservation of it. So I don't particularly like using potato in that. Again, if you're gonna be making cream of potato something or you wanna add this to um, a risotto or you wanna add it to your mashed potatoes, you could put potato in here. I wouldn't do it at this step, but um, I just don't find it very, it's not that useful. Now, one ingredient I am gonna add in here in just a second is a leek. And for those of you, you can see like this guy, he's, he's on his last leg, he needs to go. He's got some rough ends. Um, and for those of you who haven't cooked with a leek before, they're pretty interesting. Um, they are very similar to onions. They're in the same family. Um, but what we need to know when we're doing food preparation with leeks is that, you know, when, as soon as it starts growing up out of the ground, people bury the top of it with sand. And that's why this is so white, um, is because this has not been exposed to the sun. So that means that the layers of leeks are incredibly dirty, you know, just like the same with how we treat, we have to thoroughly wash our green onions. This is very much the same. So uh, you can see just how dirty uh, leeks are. And so it's really, really important that you wash them and that after you chop one, you wash your cutting board and you wash your knife um, because you've got a lot of contaminants when it comes to leeks. 
Now, when we make our soup base, we can, unlike when I would cook, uh, if I was making a soup with this as the ingredient, like a leek onion soup or leek potato soup, I would not use these tough leathery tops. These are not good for, they don't make the best eating, um, but I can use them in this because I'm just getting flavor out of them. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and rinse this guy off. I've got a special cutting board just for him. So that way I don't cross contaminate things. And the only reason why I might not use um, all of the green part is if it's just too dirty. A lot of dirt lives up in that top part. So it's very easy to just kind of feel like, well, it's just not worth it. Um, so you want to wash these when you're washing your green onions or you're washing any kind of leek or things like that. You want to wash them with cold water. Um, you don't particularly want to wash them with warm water just because it can kind of be good for any bacteria that you're trying to kill. We're going to kill it so quickly on our stove top, so I'm not too, too worried about it. So you can chop this up or you can just peel it. It makes it really nice and easy to make sure you got it all clean. And you can just throw it in there and I'll throw one in here. Um, the leek is really good when you roast it. It gets a lot of really complex flavors. So it does a great job when you roast it. Unfortunately, I didn't have it on me when I was doing the roasting. And if you rinse it thoroughly enough, you can use the little butt end if you want. Um, I have not soaked it in vinegar to kind of scrub it and everything, so I'm not gonna use that, but there's a lot of flavor in the ends of your green onions and your leeks. So this has been, this has been caramelizing now. It's been kind of sweating. Um, I can see that my onions are getting brown. My carrots are sweating nicely. So now that I've kind of done a fast version of this, I'm gonna add water to this guy as well. And it's gonna be water and salt. The salt's gonna be pulling out the flavor of everything that we've just been sauteing. If you just do water, um, you're gonna be in a situation where you're just not going to get as much flavor. Um, it's gonna be a very weak veggie tea. One thing I wanted to note is um, I am using salt. I am not using MSG, which is what I bought from our bulk store. The reason why I'm not using MSG, I love MSG. It gives you an umami flavor. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful flavor enhancer on a lot of different levels. And you absolutely can use MSG later, but I don't cook with it in an instance to try to bring out natural flavors. MSG brings its own flavor and it complements other flavors. Salt actually on a chemical level pulls flavor out of other things, um, which is why you see salt in baking ingredients, right? Like you end up thinking, why would this blueberry muffin need salt? It is pulling out and, and enhancing the flavors of the blueberry and of the vanilla. Um, and even more so, again, it's a preservative in this instance. MSG is not gonna be a preservative for you. So um, I could absolutely add some MSG at the end to taste, but from, for right now at this step, we are using um, salt. So some of the other no-no um, things like I had started with cabbage, I would not cook cabbage. Cabbage is 10 times worse than broccoli. Everything will taste like cabbage. Um, potato we had covered, sweet potato the same thing, sweet potato even more, it breaks down so quickly. Um, it's gonna end up turning into a very weak potato soup with a bunch of other vegetable chunks. Beets will turn your soup base red. Maybe you like that. Maybe that's something that you would like to have, um, but it can also add kind of that earthy sugar taste to everything. If I were going to use it, like maybe I wanted to make a soup base for borscht or something like that, and I love uh, beets, I would caramelize them. I would have chopped them up and I would have certainly roasted them if I have the time, because if you're someone who enjoys beets, you would know um, when you roast them, it just opens up so much flavor. They are great for that. Um, if I didn't have time, I would have sauteed them. So right now um, I've got everything. It's primed to probably start boiling in about five minutes or so. Um, my smaller guy, because he has a little bit less water in him, he's probably gonna start boiling in a couple minutes. And once things start boiling, I am gonna go ahead, turn it down to a simmer 
and just have it be like a very low active simmer. And then I'm gonna toss in my herbs. Um, on the herb section, I would use, I mean, parsley is a given, absolutely. It's great because it's, um, a, it's a seasoning that you're gonna want for pasta sauces, for salads, for all kinds of things. So we end up with a lot of leftovers and or you may not need all of it that you bought. So just toss it in the freezer and save it for making soup stock or soup base with. Um, thyme is another really good one. I would not put rosemary in it. Um, I would put rosemary in at the end, which is why if you remember when I was talking about like, I might add rosemary to this if I was putting it in the fridge or the freezer to use. Um, I wouldn't put rosemary in it to boil just because rosemary, um, if any of you guys have ever walked by a rosemary plant or like brushed it and then, oh my gosh, it's so aromatic. Um, it, it has pretty active oils in the actual rosemary, rosemary stems um, and in the little pine leaves that they have. So it has a pretty active oil. And if it is exposed to high heat for a long period of time, one, that oil is going to permeate everything. And so then everything's going to have a pretty intense ro rosemary flavor. But two, similar to that oak aged barrel wine situation, uh, we would be in a situation where it can get bitter. So if you want to use rosemary, put it in at the end. Um, it's great in a soup base, but I would not cook it in for, for an hour. So minimum time that you're going to want to cook these soup bases is an hour. If you rush it and you did like 40 minutes, you're gonna end up with something that does taste like vegetables. But I would say that it's going to taste about as weak as some of the store-bought vegetable broth. Um, I really like Imagine brand, but I have gotten their vegetable broth in the past and it it tastes like a weak vegetable tea. If you're looking for something that's a soup base that's going to be packing kind of a punch that you're just adding in maybe to pasta, um, maybe to a stir fry, maybe um, to anything else, to another kind of soup, just to add an enhancement of flavor and some pop and some robustness, you would not want to have weak vegetable tea. So in that instance, you're going to want to cook it for a minimum of an hour. After you've cooked it for an hour, then you can be done. Um, the longer you cook it, there's kind of a bell curve to this. Um, I would say if you cook it for anywhere between one and three hours, you're going to get more flavor, just like any kind of sauce as we reduce it and we reduce it. And as the water level is going down due to evaporation of us cooking and simmering it for so long, what is left is more and more concentrate flavor. So um, absolutely, you're going to get you're going to get a benefit to that. Once we go past that three hours, I personally have found I don't taste the difference. I can't taste the difference between a three hour and a five hour simmer. What I can taste the difference is a three hour, one to three hour simmer, let it sit overnight, um, let it cool to room temperature, toss it in the fridge, uh, get it back out and then finish the simmer or add another hour to, the, to it. So you could do it on an hour on the stove, room temperature cool down, toss it in the fridge, get it back out, do another hour simmer. That I can taste more. It had all night to steep in these broken down, opened up vegetable cells. They're releasing all their flavors. And it isn't in a situation where it's like, hurry, hurry, hurry. Um, in the sauce series, again, we talked about how oftentimes the sauce can taste more complex and we let it sit for up to 10 minutes because things are still unlocking, they're blooming. So if we give it all night to bloom and then come back and finish unlocking things, you, I can taste the difference between that. So um, I can see this guy, the oven roasted broth. He is brewing. This smells amazing. It smells like a beautiful vegetable stew. I can tell, I can smell the richness of the mushrooms. Um, if I wanted to add a little bit more depth of flavor um, and get some more saltiness in there, I've already salted it for preservation and for chemical reaction. Let's say that it is done with its hour long uh, simmer, because I am, I've turned it down. I'm gonna add in a bay leaf. Um, we're gonna do a bay leaf and then I might end up at, now that we're at the simmer stage, as soon as we are done with that, um, I might add, as soon as we get down to simmering, 
I might add some time. That's always really good as well. Um, now that this guy is at the simmer stage, I'm just gonna go ahead and toss in my herbs. If this was down um, and it was done and I was saying like, this is on the last 15 minutes of its simmering, then um, I would be in a situation where I would be tasting it and trying to decide how do I wanna open things up or add boldness to this. I, I think that, let's see if I have any here, yeah. Bragg's is really good for that. Um, I really, really like using Bragg's for high temperature cooking. Uh, I prefer using soy sauce or fermented soy sauce when I'm using things on cold. If I was doing like a steamed vegetable that I had let chilled and I tossed with like a sesame oil, I would use a fermented or a chilled soy sauce for that. But if I'm stir frying something, I like to use Bragg's and same with a sauce or a soup. So if I taste this, it's at the end, it has maybe 15, 20 minutes of the simmering left. I still want a little bit more saltiness and I want kind of a deeper punch. Um, Bragg's can give you a lot of that umami. You could also put in um, a little splash of wine. Again, same rules as with the marinara sauce. I would not use um, something that's too fruity because otherwise you're going to end up having like a, oh wow, did you put strawberries in this broth? Um, we don't want hint of cherry. We don't want hint of fig or anything like that. We want something that's pretty dry. Um, so you could put in a wine and that, um, or you could also in a, just stir this a little bit. Uh, tomato paste is one that I would really recommend. There's a couple different approaches you can take. Um, I've got, I've got some tomatoes that are past their prime, some little cherry tomatoes floating around here somewhere. Um, I can absolutely throw those in and let them just start cooking. I would do that now if I knew where I'd put them. I tuck them away somewhere. Um, you can cook them in now. I, you don't want to put too much fresh tomato in. Cherry tomatoes are great. Oh, here they are. Because they don't have a lot of big seeds and everything, but you know, like this guy's looking a little weathered. He's a little pruney looking. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and pop those into this bigger one. If you are looking for a hint of robustness and richness and you're looking for a darker broth because you're gonna make maybe a minestrone with it, um, maybe you're gonna make like a a beef and barley type soup with it, something like that, then I would absolutely recommend putting in some sun-dried tomatoes or putting in some tomato paste to taste. Probably like at most a tablespoon. If I was doing a pot this size, I would do a tablespoon at most. A little bit's gonna go a long way. And I would do that the last 15 to 20 minutes of my first boil. Um, otherwise, I think if you put it in too early, it can get bitter. If you put it in too late, it's not going to unlock things. It'll just kind of like clump down. It needs to be in kind of enough that it can break up and it can start to breathe and bloom. Um, so I would put in some tomato paste with that. And then you can also always put in just raw peppercorns. You can crush pepper and put it in there as well. That's always really good. Um, I really like to use different kinds of peppercorns. And I find for a delicate broth, like if I don't want it to be overwhelmed with the, with the pepper flavor, I really like to use, um, let me get my light here, like red, rose, or, or white peppercorns. So these are red peppercorns. And so they're a little spicy, but they're actually like, they have a fragrance. They have kind of a, a bouquet, but they won't overwhelm the sauce. So you can toss that in there. I'm gonna skip ahead. And we're going to pretend like one of these is done. Like they have, they, I let it boil for an hour and then I put it in the fridge because I'm an overachiever. I put it in the fridge, I let it sit all night. Then I came back out, plopped it back onto the stove top and it's been simmering for another hour. Now, what do we do with that? Well, we don't want the vegetable matter that's in it now. We have sucked everything out of that that we possibly could. There's nothing left to be gained by the carrots that are in there, the onions, at least not, not for the soup that we're using. Um, they're, they're kind of just taking up space. You absolutely can make compost with it. Um, you might be able to, if you're somebody who likes to reuse things, I, 
you might be able to make like a savory uh, spread or something with it. I've never successfully made anything that I wanted to eat with it, um, especially because a lot of it is tough if I put in like the tops of leeks and things like that. But um, I would love to see in the comments or hear from folks if they have something that they have used that they really enjoyed. But for the most part, um, you're gonna discard this. It does make great compost, so absolutely feel free to do that. And what we are gonna do is we're gonna use a strainer. You can use whatever you have on hand. Um, it doesn't have to be, unless for some reason you used something that's like really fine, like maybe if you were boiling things that were this fine, um, you can just use a traditional strainer if you want. So you, know, you can use just a normal strainer. Um, or you can use, I really like to use, these are vegetable storage cloths or bags that you can keep in the fridge to help keep your vegetables. Um, I really like to use these as just kind of a cheesecloth pit in a pinch. So this would be really good too if I was trying to strain. This is also really nice because I can let this cool to room temperature and then I could pour it in and I could squeeze down to the bottom. And then I can, cause all that vegetable, like this, what you're squeezing out of that carrot, squeezing out of that onion, that's like rich, juicy flavor right there. So in a pinch, if you've got something like that or cheesecloth, that can be really good. But you can also just use your strainer and a bowl and then you can get like a masher um, or a spoon and just kind of rotate around and, and get that. So pretending like, we'll pretend like our oven roasted one is done. And then I'll, I'll show you also um, the color of the broth that we've got. So I'm just gonna bring it over here so you can see. I'm just gonna go ahead and pour it through. And I'll also bring up to the camera just some of the veggies here so you can see. This has only been simmering for just a handful of minutes. And you we can already see like the the leak that was, um, or actually I yeah, this is leak. The leak that was kind of this dark green. It's now kind of this sickly washed out light pea green. My carrot. Um, is mushy. I could crush it with my fingers. So we're, we've already done a really good job of kind of extracting and it worked because especially um, with the carrot, we have roasted it, right? We did a lot of the pre-work with roasting it. And so we got a lot of those complex flavors out. And then, so if I wanted to, I would just kind of mash this, uh, maneuver this around. So that way I'm getting some of those flavors that are still locked in there. And then I'll show you in a little tasting cup here, what our broth is like, looks like. So, yeah, and it's not too salty yet. So if I wanted to take this and I wanted to turn it into a bouillon, right? Like a bouillon cube or like this soup base, um, I would then add more salt and I wouldn't add so much that then it's a spread, but I would add more salt and then I would just go ahead and let it room cool to room temperature. I would go ahead and put these in ice cube trays and freeze them. And then once they're frozen, pop them into a Tupperware or a bag, and then you can just take them out. So you don't have to end up being like, oh, I have to defrost this entire big Tupperware um, just so I can get a jar's worth. Um, then it really is great for throwing into your pasta water, throwing into your beans while you're making something, throwing into your chickpeas or your lentils. Um, so right now this has kind of a sweetness to it. I think it's from the carrots um, and maybe a little bit from the leek. The leek can be quite sweet too. Uh, I definitely absolutely would add some rags to this and a little bit of tomato paste. That tomato paste is going to keep it sweet because that tomato paste has quite a bit of sugar in it. Um, and I think I would add maybe a splash of a dry wine or a vinegar to kind of brighten it. Um, but certainly that taste does tell me this is not done. This is not ready. It tastes like a sweet hint of a complex vegetable tea. So I'm going to go ahead and add it. Since I'm done, I'm going to add it back into just this main one. I don't need to have all of the pots brewing all of my vegetable teas. This guy just started simmering not too long ago. 
I'm going to go ahead and share the link to that PETA um, food friendly coconut so that you can know what brands to get um, so that you aren't exploiting monkey labor. Does anybody have any questions or any tips or suggestions that you think that I missed in making soup bases? And I just put that link in the chat. Okay. Well, if anybody has any questions, absolutely feel free to email me. Um, uh, absolutely feel free to email me. My name is Danielle, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at northwestveg, N-W-V-E-G dot org. And uh, it's the perfect season to start. And this is just one of the kinds of recipes that you can't mess up. If you like vegetables and you like soup, put the vegetables in the water, roast it, boil it. And even if you end up making something that you're like, this isn't amazing, it's not going to be dangerous to eat. And it's also not going to be bad. It's going to be something that you're just going to spruce up as you're learning. So um, absolutely. Thank you for being here. And we will see you next time.